a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Joan of Arc Joan of Arc, nicknamed the Maid of Orléans, is considered a heroine of France for her role during the Lancastrian phase of the Hundred Years' War and was canonized as a Roman Catholic saint. Joan of Arc was born to Jacques d'Arc and Isabelle Romay, a peasant family, at Domremy in northeast France. Joan said she received visions of the Archangel Michael, Saint Margaret, and Saint Catherine of Alexandria instructing her to support Charles VII and recover France from English domination late in the Hundred Years' War. The uncrowned King Charles VII sent Joan to the Siege of Orléans as part of a relief mission. She gained prominence after the siege was lifted only nine days later. Several additional swift victories led to Charles VII's coronation at Reims. This long-awaited event boosted French morale and paved the way for the final French victory. On 23 May 1430, she was captured at Compenia by the Burgundian faction, which was allied with the English. She was later handed over to the English and put on trial by the pro-English bishop of Beauvais Pierre Cauchon on a variety of charges. After Cauchon declared her guilty she was burned at the stake on 30 May 1431, dying at about 19 years of age. In 1456, an inquisitorial court authorized by Pope Calixtus III examined the trial, debunked the charges against her, pronounced her innocent, and declared her a martyr. In the 16th century she became a symbol of the Catholic League, and in 1803 she was declared a national symbol of France by the decision of Napoleon Bonaparte. She was beatified in 1909 and canonized in 1920. Joan of Arc is one of the nine secondary patron saints of France, along with Saint Denis, Saint Martin of Tours, Saint Louis, Saint Michael, Saint Remy, Saint Petronilla, Saint Radegund and Saint Therese of Lisieux. Joan of Arc has remained a popular figure in literature, painting, sculpture, and other cultural works since the time of her death, and many famous writers, filmmakers and composers have created works about her. Cultural depictions of her have continued in films, theatre, television, video games, music, and performances to this day. Background the Hundred Years' War had begun in 1337 as an inheritance dispute over the French throne, interspersed with occasional periods of relative peace. Nearly all the fighting had taken place in France, and the English army's use of Chevauchy tactics had devastated the economy. The French population had not regained its former size prior to the Black Death of the mid-14th century, and its merchants were isolated from foreign markets. Prior to the appearance of Joan of Arc, the English had nearly achieved their goal of a dual monarchy under English control and the French army had not achieved any major victories for a generation. In the words of de Vries, the Kingdom of France was not even a shadow of its 13th century prototype. The French king, at the time of Joan's birth, Charles VI, suffered from bouts of insanity and was often unable to rule. The king's brother Louis, Duke of Orléans, and the king's cousin John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, quarreled over the regency of France and the guardianship of the royal children. This dispute included accusations that Louis was having an extramarital affair with the Queen, Isabeau of Bavaria, and allegations that John the Fearless kidnapped the royal children. The conflict climaxed with the assassination of the Duke of Orléans in 1407 on the orders of the Duke of Burgundy. The young Charles of Orléans succeeded his father as Duke and was placed in the custody of his father-in-law the Count of Armagnac. Their faction became known as the Armagnac faction, and the opposing party led by the Duke of Burgundy was called the Burgundian faction. Henry V of England took advantage of these internal divisions when he invaded the kingdom in 1415, winning a dramatic victory at again caught on 25 October and subsequently capturing many northern French towns. In 1418 Paris was taken by the Burgundians who massacred the Count of Armagnac and about 2,500 of his followers. The future French king, Charles VII, assumed the title of Dauphin, the heir, to the throne, at the age of 14, after all four of his older brothers had died in succession. His first significant official act was to conclude a peace treaty with the Duke of Burgundy in 1419. This ended in disaster when Armagnac partisans assassinated John the Fearless. During a meeting under Charles' guarantee of protection, the new Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Good, blamed Charles for the murder, 
and entered into an alliance with the English. The Allied forces conquered large sections of France. In 1420 the Queen of France, Isabeau of Bavaria, signed the Treaty of Troyes, which granted the succession of the French throne to Henry V and his heirs instead of her son Charles. This agreement revived suspicions that the Dauphin may have been the illegitimate product of Isabeau's rumoured affair with the late Duke of Orléans rather than the son of King Charles VI. Henry V and Charles VI died within two months of each other in 1422, leaving an infant, Henry VI of England, the nominal monarch of both kingdoms. Henry V's brother, John of Lancaster, first Duke of Bedford, acted as regent. By the time Joan of Arc began to influence events in 1429, nearly all of northern France and some parts of the southwest were under Anglo-Burgundian control. The English controlled Paris and Rouen while the Burgundian faction controlled Reims, which had served as the traditional coronation site for French kings since 816. This was an important consideration since neither claimant to the throne of France had been officially crowned yet. In 1428 the English had begun the siege of Orléans, one of the few remaining cities still loyal to Charles VII and an important objective, since it held a strategic position along the Loire River, which made it the last obstacle to an assault on the remainder of the French heartland. In the words of one modern historian, on the fate of Orléans hung that of the entire kingdom. No one was optimistic that the city could long withstand the siege. For generations, there had been prophecies in France which promised France would be saved by a virgin from the borders of Lorraine, who would work miracles, and that France will be lost by a woman and shall thereafter be restored by a virgin. The second prophecy predicating France would be lost by a woman was taken to refer to Isabeau's role in signing the Treaty of Troyes. Life Joan was the daughter of Jacques d'Arc and Isabelle Romé in Domremy, a village which was then in the French part of the Duchy of Bar. Joan's parents owned about 50 acres of land and her father supplemented his farming work with a minor position as a village official, collecting taxes and heading the local watch. They lived in an isolated patch of eastern France that remained loyal to the French crown despite being surrounded by pro-Burgundian lands. Several local raids occurred during her childhood, and on one occasion her village was burned. Joan was illiterate and it is believed that her letters were dictated by her to scribes, and she signed her letters with the help of others. At her trial, Joan stated that she was about 19 years old, which implies she thought she was born around 1412. She later testified that she experienced her first vision in 1425 at the age of 13, when she was in her father's garden, and saw visions of figures she identified as Saint Michael, Saint Catherine, and Saint Margaret, who told her to drive out the English and bring the Dauphin to Reims for his coronation. She said she cried when they left, as they were so beautiful. At the age of 16, she asked a relative named Durand Lassuis to take her to the nearby town of Vaucluse where she petitioned the garrison commander, Robert de Baudricourt, for an armed escort to bring her to the French royal court at Sino. Baudricourt's sarcastic response did not deter her. She returned the following January and gained support from two of Baudricourt's soldiers, Jean de Metz and Bertrand de Polangy. According to Jean de Metz, she told him that, I must be at the king's side. There will be no help if not from me. Although I would rather have remained spinning, wool, at my mother's side, yet must I go and must I do this thing, for my lord wills that I do so. Under the auspices of Metz and Polangi, she was given a second meeting, where she made a prediction about a military reversal at the Battle of Rivry near Orléans several days before messengers arrived to report it, according to the journal Du Siege d'Orléans, which portrays Joan as a miraculous figure. Joan came to know of the battle through Grace Divine while tending her flocks in Lorraine and used this divine revelation to persuade Baudricourt to take her to the Dauphin. Rise Robert de Baudricourt granted Joan an escort to visit Chino after news from Orleans confirmed her assertion of a defeat. She made the journey through hostile Burgundian territory disguised as a male soldier, a fact which would later lead to charges of cross-dressing against her, although her escort viewed it as a normal precaution. Two of the members of her escort said they and the people of Vaucalers provided her with this clothing and had suggested it to her. Joan's first meeting with Charles took place at the royal court at Chino in 1429, when she was aged 17 and he 26. 
After arriving at the court she made a strong impression on Charles, during a private conference with him. During this time Charles' mother-in-law Yolanda of Aragon was planning to finance a relief expedition to Olean. Joan asked for permission to travel with the army and wear protective armor, which was provided by the royal government. She depended on donated items for her armor, horse, sword, banner, and other items utilized by her entourage. Historian Stephen W. Ritchie explains her attraction to the royal court by pointing out that they may have viewed her as the only source of hope for a regime that was near collapse, after years of one humiliating defeat after another. Both the military and civil leadership of France were demoralized and discredited. When the Dauphin Charles granted Joan's urgent request to be equipped for war and placed at the head of his army, his decision must have been based in large part on the knowledge that every orthodox, every rational option had been tried and had failed. Only a regime in the final straits of desperation would pay any heed to an illiterate farm girl who claimed that the voice of God was instructing her to take charge of her country's army and lead it to victory. Upon her arrival on the scene, Joan effectively turned the long-standing Anglo-French conflict into a religious war, a course of action that was not without risk. Charles' advisers were worried that unless Joan's orthodoxy could be established beyond doubt, that she was not a heretic or a sorceress, Charles' enemies could easily make the allegation that his crown was a gift from the devil. To circumvent this possibility, the Dauphin ordered background inquiries and a theological examination at Poitiers to verify her morality. In April 1429, the Commission of Inquiry declared her to be of irreproachable life, a good Christian, possessed of the virtues of humility, honesty and simplicity. The theologians at Poitiers did not render a decision on the issue of divine inspiration. Rather, they informed the Dauphin that there was a favorable presumption to be made on the divine nature of her mission. This was enough for Charles. But they also stated that he had an obligation to put Joan to the test. To doubt or abandon her without suspicion of evil would be to repudiate the Holy Spirit and to become unworthy of God's aid, they declared. They recommended that her claims should be put to the test by seeing if she could lift the siege of Orléans as she had predicted. She arrived at the besieged city of Orléans on 29 April 1429. Jean d'Orléans, the acting head of the ducal family of Orléans on behalf of his captive half-brother, initially excluded her from war councils and failed to inform her when the army engaged the enemy. However, his decision to exclude her did not prevent her presence at most councils and battles. The extent of her actual military participation and leadership is a subject of debate among historians. On the one hand, Joan stated that she carried her banner in battle and had never killed anyone, preferring her banner, forty times, better than a sword, and the army was always directly commanded by a nobleman, such as the Duke of Arlenson for example. On the other hand, Many of these same noblemen stated that Joan had a profound effect on their decisions since they often accepted the advice she gave them, believing her advice was divinely inspired. In either case, historians agree that the army enjoyed remarkable success during her brief time with it. Military Campaigns The appearance of Joan of Arc at Boléan coincided with a sudden change in the pattern of the siege. During the five months before her arrival, the defenders had attempted only one offensive assault, which had ended in defeat. On the 4th of May, however, the Armagnacs attacked and captured the outlying fortress of Saint Loup, followed on the 5th of May by a march to a second fortress called Saint Jean Le Blanc, which was found deserted. When English troops came out to oppose the advance, a rapid cavalry charge drove them back into their fortresses, apparently without a fight. The Armagnacs then attacked and captured an English fortress built around a monastery called Les Augustins. That night, Armagnac troops maintained positions on the south bank of the river before attacking the main English stronghold, called Les Tourelles. On the morning of 7 May, contemporaries acknowledged Joan as the heroine of the engagement. She was wounded by an arrow between the neck and shoulder while holding her banner in the trench outside Les Tourelles, but later returned to encourage a final assault that succeeded in taking the fortress. The English retreated from Orléans the next day, and the siege was over. At Chino and Poitiers, Joan had declared that she would provide a sign at Orléans. The lifting of the siege was interpreted by many people to be that sign 
and it gained her the support of prominent clergy such as the Archbishop of Ombrun and theologian Jean Gerson, both of whom wrote supportive treatises immediately following this event. To the English, the ability of this peasant girl to defeat their armies was regarded as proof that she was possessed by the devil. The British medievalist Beverly Boyd noted that this charge was not just propaganda, and was sincerely believed. Since the idea that God was supporting the French via Joan was distinctly unappealing to an English audience, the sudden victory at Orléans also led to many proposals for further offensive action. Joan persuaded Charles VII to allow her to accompany the army with Duke John II of Arlençon, and she gained royal permission for her plan to recapture nearby bridges along the Loire as a prelude to an advance on Reims and the coronation of Charles VII. This was a bold proposal, because Reims was roughly twice as far away as Paris and deep within enemy territory. The English expected an attempt to recapture Paris or an attack on Normandy. The Duke of Arlençon accepted Joan's advice concerning strategy. Other commanders including Jean Dorlin had been impressed with her performance at Orléans and became her supporters. Arlençon credited her with saving his life at Jargo, where she warned him that a cannon on the walls was about to fire at him. During the same siege she withstood a blow from a stone that hit her helmet while she was near the base of the town's wall. The army took Jargo on the 12th of June, Monsieur Loire on the 15th of June, and Beaugency on the 17th of June. The English army withdrew from the Loire Valley and headed north on the 18th of June, joining with an expected unit of reinforcements under the command of Sir John Fastolf. Joan urged the Armagnacs to pursue, and the two armies clashed southwest of the village of Patay. The battle at Patay might be compared to a Gincourt in reverse. The French vanguard attacked a unit of English archers who had been placed to block the road. A rout ensued that decimated the main body of the English army and killed or captured most of its commanders. Fastolf escaped with a small band of soldiers and became the scapegoat for the humiliating English defeat. The French suffered minimal losses. The French army left Jean on 29 June on the march toward Reims and accepted the conditional surrender of the Burgundian-held city of Auxerre on 3 July. Other towns in the army's path returned to French allegiance without resistance. Troyes, the site of the treaty that tried to disinherit Charles VII, was the only one to put up even brief opposition. The army was in short supply of food by the time it reached Troyes, but the army was in luck. A wandering friar named Brother Richard had been preaching about the end of the world at Troyes and convinced local residents to plant beans, a crop with an early harvest. The hungry army arrived as the beans ripened. Troyes capitulated after a bloodless four-day siege. Reims opened its gates to the army on 16 July 1429. The coronation took place the following morning. Although Joan and the Duke of Arlençon urged a prompt march on Paris, the royal court preferred to negotiate a truce with Duke Philip of Burgundy. The Duke violated the purpose of the agreement by using it as a stalling tactic to reinforce the defense of Paris. The French army marched through the towns near Paris during the interim and accepted several peaceful surrenders. The Duke of Bedford led an English force and confronted the French army in a standoff at the Battle of Montepilloy on 15 August. The French assault at Paris ensued on 8 September. Despite a wound to the leg from a crossbow bolt, Joan remained in the inner trench of Paris until she was carried back to safety by one of the commanders. The following morning the army received a royal order to withdraw. Most historians blame French Grand Chamberlain Georges de la Tremouille for the political blunders that followed the coronation. In October, Joan was with the royal army when it took saint pierre la Moutier, followed by an unsuccessful attempt to take La Chaite sur Loire in November and December. On 29 December, Joan and her family were ennobled by Charles VII as a reward for her actions. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?